In a world where SLS's ongoing failure is justified and ignored, while Starship races towards transformational capabilities, NASA needs to think very deeply about its place in a human spaceflight program that appears poised to proceed without NASA at its center. This is when NASA finally realizes why Starship is better than SLS rocket. Yeah, one of the sweeping changes we've seen in the aerospace industry during the last two decades is the rise of new players. SpaceX is the most notable among them, and it's certainly the most disruptive. Their Falcon Heavy beat the SLS rocket to orbit by at least four and a half years, but it's also telling that SpaceX's next generation rocket, the Starship vehicle, also very nearly beat the SLS rocket to orbit. If Starship reaches even half its potential, it will exceed the SLS rocket in every possible way. It's more powerful, far less expensive, and fully reusable. And it can launch hundreds of times a year, not just once. Those who have focused on the space race this year between SLS and Starship have missed the point. The real question is not which of the two super heavy lift rockets launches first, rather it's how many Starships will launch between the first and second flights of the SLS rocket. Nominally, the second SLS mission is due to fly in 2024, but it will probably slip into 2025. Conceivably, Starship could launch a dozen times between now and then, maybe 30 times, perhaps more. More than a decade ago, the Augustine Commission said NASA should find a sustainable trajectory. Low-cost reusable rockets are quite clearly NASA's sustainable trajectory. And NASA is already buying into this future. Since letting the SLS and Orion contracts, it has almost exclusively awarded fixed-price contracts for other elements of its exploration programs. Through these contracts, NASA has moved more towards buying services from the U.S. commercial space industry, as opposed to providing a top-level design and controlling every step of the development process. This has been a really tough thing, said Kathy Loiters, who leads operational human exploration for NASA at the Ascendex conference in Houston in April. NASA has had a very hard time going from saying I'm the one doing it to we are doing it. But that effort has been worth it. Loiters explained that NASA is working with the industry to create as many types of partnerships as possible to meet the demands of its various missions. The focus is on helping the industry understand what NASA needs and then trying to buy services that those companies can also sell to other space customers. This incentivizes private industry to self-invest in these technologies and deliver low-cost, timely products. We do that because we feel like this is important for us as a nation to maintain our leadership in space, Loiter said. Every nation in the world is envious of the way that we have created these new relationships with our commercial industry. NASA proved this in April 2021 when the agency selected SpaceX's Starship to serve as the human landing system for the Artemis moon program. This was almost unimaginable even a couple of years ago, but now the ambitious Starship vehicle is firmly on NASA's critical path back to the moon. For now, Starship will merely ferry astronauts down to the moon from lunar orbit and back up. But it's not too difficult to see astronauts eventually launching from Earth and Starship and returning there in the same way. If Starship can be shown to be safe and effective, still ifs to be sure, it is far superior to SLS and Orion in cost, reusability, and cadence. The irony is that Congress has agreed to fund Starship at the level of $2.9 billion for development and a couple of lunar missions. That's less than what NASA spends annually on SLS and Orion development costs, but it's still significant. And more importantly, in funding Starship, Congress is funding the rocket that will one day almost certainly put its beloved SLS booster out of business. For one reason only, NASA has admitted that SpaceX can make a much better rocket than them. So, if Starship is more powerful, more capable, costs less, and launches more often, will SLS be rendered obsolete the moment Starship becomes operational? The short answer is yes. The long answer is also yes, but with some important caveats. Firstly, SLS development has engaged many different partners around the United States and the world. A map on NASA's website pinpoints contributing contractors in every U.S. state and over 20 partners across Europe. Part of the Artemis program's $93 billion price tag is distributed to those companies and their workers. Keeping those aerospace industry jobs going became a yearly focus for many in the U.S. Congress hoping to boost their political standing with constituents and district aerospace companies. This helps give SLS and the Artemis program staying power. 
In her recent book, Escaping Gravity, Diversion Books 2022, former NASA Deputy Administrator Lori Garver describes the symbiotic backscratching that takes place between Congress and the aerospace industry as a self-licking ice cream cone. And it goes back to the space shuttle era and earlier. This pattern isn't restricted to the space industry, of course. Funneling jobs of all sorts to their constituents is a time-honored congressional practice. So, what's the answer? SLS isn't going away anytime soon. The launch vehicles for Artemis missions 2 through 4 are already being assembled, even with the next Artemis mission two years away, or more. But there is an argument to be made for the Artemis program as a whole. If the purpose of NASA is to advance humanity's exploration of space, assuming that directive is supported by the general populace, it behooves a society to pool its resources for that endeavor into a publicly controlled agency, rather than relying fully upon a private company or person with the ability to shape that undertaking however they see fit, even if that creates an imperfect process riddled with inefficiencies. The coming togetherness that occurs when so many have a stake in a program as large as Artemis should not be underestimated. Hundreds came out for the first SLS rollout to the launch pad in March of this year. Hundreds of thousands arrived at the Space Coast for the Artemis 1 launch, and they were not here just to see a big rocket. People from every walk of life across the United States have poured their careers into making SLS a reality. The glory days of the Apollo moon missions are a distant memory for some and an awe-inspiring historical feat for most. Artemis is helping reignite that spark for exploration in a way that has allowed people to feel invested in the program's success. People feel ownership over Artemis. When NASA says we are going, the agency isn't talking about some in-group of elite astronauts. They're talking about us. We are launching people back into deep space. We are sending humans back to the moon. We are all of us, and we're doing it together. So, is the cost of the SLS and the Artemis program as a whole worth it? Maybe. If Artemis accomplishes all that it has set out to accomplish over the next 10 years or more, that maybe could shift to a probably. Once SpaceX's Starship is launching as often as the company hopes, it's possible we'll see a cancellation of Artemis similar to that of Apollo. But the difference, hopefully, would be the emergence of a bold and flourishing space industry to cement the obsolescence of SLS, letting a new age of human exploration blossom, rather than another 50 years of human spaceflight stagnation, in which people never venture beyond low Earth orbit. And that just about wraps it up for today's episode. Don't forget to share your ideas in the comments section. Everyone's support will be the motivation for us to create more quality content. Thanks, and see you next time.